All right, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you here at the, at the Groovy Tag from Apache at home. Uh, I got about 40 minutes, a little bit less, to talk about uh, Groovy metaprogramming. And uh, so I was hoping that most of the attendees will come from a strong Java background and not so much for Groovy. We'll see how it goes if most people already know what I'm going to talk about. And uh, please feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat and interrupt me at any time whenever there is a burning question. Otherwise, we'll still have time at the end of the session for any questions. So my name is Andrew Salmurai, and uh, I work for Oracle and a Java champion. I'm a member of the Apache Groovy PMC. I've uh, been involved with Groovy since uh, 2006, if I'm mistaken, like 14 years ago. Since I discovered language, I just fell in love with it, and I keep working with it. And uh, I'm so happy to see that there are also other people like yourselves interested in the, in the language. Now, I think that you might have seen some of the tweets that have been going out just before the event happened, but Paul just announced that uh, Groovy 306 came out a couple of hours ago, and the first alpha release for 4.0 is also pretty much out of the oven. So please download these, these releases, and um, we will welcome all the feedback that you can give us specifically on version 4, because that brings in uh, binary incompatibilities and some changes that Paul uh, specifically mentioned on his talk. And if you miss it, please come back and watch it. So metaprogramming is basically, well, this is the definition from Wikipedia, but it's basically is the, uh, the ability for a program to change itself or to treat other programs as data. And uh, it allows you as a developer to adapt a program even while it's running. So you can add behavior and remove behavior. There are different languages that allow uh, the um, metaprogramming. And specifically, Groovy allows two types of metaprogramming, the runtime version and the compile time version. Now, if you remember uh, the matrix, the blue pill is where you stay in Wonderland. And this is because in the runtime aspect, you must be running Groovy code. But in the compile time aspect, you may be able to interact with the Java bytecode as well. So we'll start with runtime, which is the perhaps the one that most people encounter uh, you know, at the first try. And uh, in order to understand the groovy metaprogramming of runtime, we need to talk about the mob. But not the one that you use to scrub the floors. We were talking about the meta object protocol. Now, I'm going to oversimplify things a lot, but basically you can think of the meta object protocol as the, the mechanism that allows um, a Groovy to add the dynamic behavior to class. Now, every class has a companion meta class. The meta class is the one that can provide additional behavior, such as properties of methods. So in a sense, when you ask, uh, when you invoke a message or when you invoke a method or get a property from an instance or a class in Groovy, it does not go uh, directly to the same class as you think as you would do in Java. It actually gets routed through the meta object protocol, through the meta class to figure out if there is any additional things that the meta class can do for you. Now, the modifications that you make to the meta classes are only visible to Groovy while you're running Groovy. So here's a simple example and uh, using what is known as the expand meta class. Say you have a Groovy class called person that has a simple property. So you know that the Groovy compiler will generate a property getter and a setter for name. And uh, at any other point in time in our program, we will add a new method called greet, which takes one argument. I mean, it could be a string, could be anything here. And what this method is going to do is return a Groovy string with the evaluation of that particular expression. So we can create an instance of the class and invoke the greet method. And surprise, surprise, turns out that the greet method works because again, the Groovy runtime will ask the meta class if there's anything that can be done. And in this case, it matches the greet method and then invokes that particular closure. You can also uh, enhance a Java class in the same way. For example, here with adding a new method called SpongeBob, if you're familiar with the meme, 
uh, to the Java Lang stream class through its meta class. And so what we're going to do is change the contents, well, actually create a new instant uh, string based on the contents of the original one. And this thing is just uh, uppercasing or lowercasing the, uh, the given input. And I know that this is very trivial because it doesn't take into account that what if uh, the initial input is all uppercase, right? Anyway, I mean, it's a simple thing, but it shows that you can also change or adapt uh, system Java class. Now, Groovy took inspiration from other languages that came before it. Uh, one of the early languages that many people regard, have in high regard from the early days is Smalltalk. Smalltalk is said that it only had two keywords and everything else was just built on top of itself. And one of the nice features that Smalltalk has in terms of the uh, dynamic aspect is if you were to send a message or a method to um, a type that does not have that particular message, you could add or route the, the message to a certain plumbing mechanism to make sure that the type can react. This is known as the does not understand. Now, what does does not understand mean? Let me show you. So say that you have a full class and you specifically add the following signature. There's a method name called method missing that returns an object, takes when the name of the method that you want to invoke and as many arguments. In this case, well, it's either object which could be an object array or variable arguments. So what this method is doing is if I invoke something that is not defined in my foo class, then method missing is going to catch it and do whatever is need to be done. So we can see in, in lines seven and eight, the creation on a foo instance and the invocation of the method say with an argument. And method missing handles that and say, what do, you, what do you mean by say groovy? And you can see that it's actually a list of arguments. And uh, in this way, you can add the method missing to a class and change the behavior if you were to, for some miracle, try to call something that did not exist at the time of compilation that does not exist per se the source code. You can do the same thing with uh, getters for properties. Uh, there is the convention for property missing that takes a name and an argument that will be the setter or property missing that takes just a name and returns an object that will be the getter. So in the example here, the first in line 12, we're trying to get the ID property and we get the message, you don't have a property named ID. And in line 13, we try to set the lang property on the foo instance, which we know that foo doesn't have any properties at all. So we get the message, can't assign the lang property to you. And this is because uh, property missing was able to handle these uh, invocations. So in order to use uh, the does not understand feature, you have to follow the method signatures. These method signatures can be added to a Java class in source code if you want to. So when you're running in Groovy, this particular type, it will still react to the way that you will typically see in Groovy. Here's another thing that you can do at runtime. It's called categories. Now, categories follow a particular syntax. So it's a class that defines as many static methods as you want. And the first argument of the method will be the type of the receiver. So in this case, the grid method, it will be attached to instances of type string. And categories have a scope. Here in the, in the, um, the line seven to nine is the scope of that particular grid category. If I intend, if I try to use the grid method outside of that scope, I will get a runtime exception because the method does not exist. It's just within that scope that the method will be available to you. You can do this with any class that exposes static methods. So for example, the string utilities for common slang, which contains a bunch of static methods that work with strings, which all of them take a string as the first argument, which means that we can use it like it's shown in the uh, in lines four to six. As uh, string utils have many methods and one of them is called chop, which takes the last um, element from the string. In this case, we were taking the Y from Groovy. That's a bit sad. So remember categories uh, follow a vertical format. They affect the classes inside a specific scope. All the methods must be static and the first argument becomes a type of the receiver. 
Here's another thing that we can do. Uh, it's called mixings. Uh, we can, it's similar like categories that you have. You also have the first um, uh, type of the method will be the receiver. You can define your own classes in Groovy, Java, or any other JVM language for that matter, as long as you follow the format. And then line 10, what we're doing is we're mixing the behavior at runtime. So we're saying that the string class will also have all the behavior exposed by greeter and string duties. Now, after we do this, we can invoke the greet and chop and any other method as many times as we want to. And it's not limited to a scope. It's just after line 10 that this behavior becomes available. So just like categories, mixings have a scope, but this scope is not limited. And you can apply for, for both Groovy and Java classes. Now, similar to mixings, we have traits, which I know they are, they are a specific feature in the language. So we have syntax for this. And basically traits are interfaces that, ex that have behavior and they can also have state. So say here, we have an interface called name provider. I mean, this could be a Java interface if you want to. Then we have the definition of a trait that implements save property. I mean, says interface and it defines a property. That means that the with name trait will have a property with getter and setter and a, a private field. And then we define a class person that implements, not that implements, it does not extend the with name trait. And that will give us access to, to that property. So say now we have a grid method that does not belong to anybody. It takes a name provider and as an instance and we invoke the, uh, the get name on it because well, it's a name provider, right? And we invoke a create an instance of person and we can call grid on it and it works because in the constructor of person, we can set the name. And this is because the person implements the trait. So in this way, we have implemented a stateful trait. Now Java A gave us default methods on interfaces, but it does not give, gave us the uh, ability to have a state on, on those interfaces. Java 9 gave us the op opportunity to have static methods on interfaces. Well, Groovy gives you all this plus this stateful option. And uh, well, we added the feature before Java 8 came around, but it now doesn't matter because the latest release of Java is 15 and uh, well, still most people are still using Java 8. So it just works. And then the last option that I would like to discuss right now for uh, runtime metaprogramming are extension modules. And uh, they follow a syntax that is similar to mixings but they are globally available. You can modify Groovy and Java classes. You can provide instance and static methods alike. Uh, whatever you provide in these static extension modules will, can also be type checked by the compiler. So if you're working on your favorite IDE and you try to invoke a method that is extends, uh, is provided by the extension model, you get auto completion. And if the, uh, the name of the method is wrong, of course, you will get a, a red squiggly. In order to do this, you need not just the extension module itself, but also an additional resource called the module description. And I'm going to show you a simple example. Many years ago in the Griffon framework, uh, we had an extension called uh, uh, the bcrypt plugin, which allows you to generate a hash following the bcrypt algorithm. And we want this method called encode as vcrypt to be available to string instances. So instead of just calling something like vcrypt.encode as vcrypt and pass the string itself, we want to have the string dot encode as vcrypt. So we will add that, that encode as vcrypt and encode, well, those two methods to a string. So we define an extension that looks like in a category or a mixing. We call it implemented in Java or Groovy. That's the same. In this case, it's implemented in Java. The next thing we need to do is define a resource that has to follow these conventions. It has to be inside the meta inf Groovy uh, directory. And uh, the file name has to be Oracle. It has to be runtime extension module. I suppose this might change in the future with Groovy 4 because of the changes in the, uh, the package names. And uh, you have to have at least uh, three uh, elements in the file, the model name, the module version, uh, this is for you to keep track of, and a list of either extension classes 
these are the, the classes that provide instance methods and a list, if additional list of static instantiation classes. They will be the classes that provide static methods to the types. In this case, this doesn't do, this doesn't provide any static methods, just instance methods. So once this is in place and you put this in the class path, then a string classes will be automatically enhanced. You will see the encode as bcrypt as a method coming directly from uh, the, the string class, and the IDE will give you code completion for this, which is quite nice. Now, remember all these things that we have seen so far apply if you run Groovy, if you're using Groovy as runtime. So the next aspect that we're going to look at is compile time, which will also allow us to, to um, run the modifications on a runtime with Groovy, but uh, these modifications can also be visible to Java. Why? Because every change that we do at compile time, well, it, we generate bytecode. And this bytecode is visible, visible to Java. Now, Groovy is one of those languages that had a really nice integration within, uh, between Groovy and Java. So a Groovy class looks like a Java class to Java, and the Java class looks like a Groovy class to Groovy, right? Because of this, then any modifications that we do in the Groovy bytecode are visible to Java, Java classes as well. Now, and these modifications can also be type checked and statically compiled by the compiler itself. So what's the secret sauce in order to, to make this work? Uh, it's something that Paul and Arisha has touched before, which are ASD transformations. There are two flavors of ASD transformations. There are the local transformations and the global transformations. Now, in order to write your own transformations, you need to know about the compiler APIs and the ASD type hierarchy and lots of group internals and plenty of dark magic, kind of. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, local transformations are perhaps the ones that you encounter the most. For this to work, you have to have two elements. The interface that defines the entry point. I mean, the interface can annotate a type, a method, a field, anything that that annotation can can annotate. And you need the, the implementation of the transformation itself that is somehow links to the annotation. So here, let me show you one of the easiest one, the two string annotation. What this is going to do is generate a two string method that contains the name of the type of the class and the contents of all the properties. We can modify or pass additional arguments to the string annotation to include the names of the properties. In this case, I didn't, we just get the values. How is this transformation implemented? We need the definition of the annotation. I mean, it's just regular uh, um, metadata for the uh, annotation. So there is one key aspect right there in line four. Groovy ASD transformation class. This is the link that says to the compiler, if you encounter this annotation to string anywhere in the code, then when the time is right, invoke the two string AST transformation to do the dirty work. And the two string AST transformation, the only thing that it needs to do is implement the AST transformation interface. There's a base class called abstract AST transformation that gives you access to the magic. But you also need to uh, to tell the uh, the Groovy compiler in which phase you want this transformation to run. As you might be aware, the Groovy compiler has nine phases, and the most common phase for us to do our work is during canonicalization, because at this time we have all the resolve inputs, we have resolved a lot of things, so the class is almost ready, it's pretty much formed, but it's before the class generation. Here are a few other examples. Uh, canonical is actually a meta annotation that applies others like to stream, hash code, uh, equals, and, equals and hash code, and tuple constructor. If you're familiar with Lombok, Groovy Transform Canonical is a parallel or akin to Lombok's add data uh, transformation. So in this case, we apply canonical to a class, we have two properties, and we get uh, to a string implementation for it, as we saw earlier. We can also have uh, different, different types of constructors. We can pass the arguments in the order of their definition for the properties, so name and last name first. Or we can use the map constructor 
<clears throat> and we can also get equals and hash code automatically implemented. Now, the advantages of this transformation is that it follows the guidelines from Josh Block Effective Java. Look, we have another transformation called category. It's our friend from runtime as before. The difference from the previous category is that in this case, we can have our categories defined as with instance methods. And it's that this object that we can see is the argument for the category annotation that is going to decide what will be the type of the receiver. We're making it a string again. Now, doesn't matter if you use the runtime definition of category or the S3 definition of category, you still make use of the category within a scope. So you have to use the scope like that. What about making immutable classes? I mean, there's a lot of hassle to, to create immutable classes. There are more than seven or eight rules that you must follow. And those rules are recursive if you follow Josh Block's advice on effective Java. Or you can simply apply a transformation called immutable and be done with it. And we see that once we have created, defined define the point class, uh, we create three instances of the point. Notice that we can have different versions of the constructor. And because the values of point one and point two are equal for X and Y, the equals and hash code says these two objects are identical. But point one and point three have different values for Y. That means that equals and hash code will be different. But what about this one? Have you ever had trouble implementing the comparable interface? If you do, then just apply the sortable transformation and uh, pretty much you get implementations of the compared to and just like that. There are, as a matter of fact, more than 70 uh, tr uh, AC transformations available from Groovy Core in a various different set of packages. Now, I just touched in a few ones, but um, um, there, there are so many others. I mean, there are annotations for uh, dealing with a time and interrupt in scripts uh, for chair recursion or logging statements for all the popular logging frameworks and uh, triggering property change events if you're into Swing, which, by the way, I love that stuff uh, just because, well, <laughs> Griffin, of course, and, uh, and so many others. So moving on, Gluby, the global AC transformations. They only require the transformation class itself. And the global transformations by their name, they are applied to every single class available during the compilation step. So you don't need an annotation. So if you have 10 classes during the compilation step, then all those 10 classes will be uh, manipulated by the AC transformation in one way or another, if there's some, some match mechanism. But it's been said, uh, there are not that many global ST transformations that you can find out there. As a matter of fact, I believe Groovy Graves, the AdGraph ST transformation, is the only hybrid local and global transformation. But if you want to know more about global transformations, you definitely have to have a look at the Spock framework, and uh, which has been said that it's a huge ST transformation in itself. It messages the... Um, the bytecode in so in so way in, in in so many different ways that you wouldn't believe what is going on. So if you really want to know more how AST transformations work, well, this, the Spock framework is a really good place to to start. Implementing your own ST transformations, as I said earlier, you have to know a little bit about the compiler APIs. You have to know what expression and the statement class node, property node, and many other things. You may use AST Builder, which is a quite nice utility class to create expressions. Uh, you can create expressions based from text, so you can supply a sample text code, and that the AST Builder will create the appropriate expression and statement objects, or you can provide code as is, as an example, and it will do the same thing, or you can use some builder-like fashion uh, to create expression. In this case, you still have to know what expression, the statement, and everything else is. Alternatively, you can use the macro methods to simplify expressions, and there is a macro AC transformation that can also be used to simplify how you can create these set expressions. And in any case, I will certainly recommend you to have a look and refer to the core AC transformations, such as to string, yeah, canonical, equal hash code, 
to figure out more how they were uh, implemented. There is a really nice resource out there if you want to know more about the different uh, options for metaprogramming, because I just touched a few things. There are more options for meta classes. There are more options for using mixings and the trace and uh, AST transformations. The first link contains a, a, the most descriptive option for all the AST transformations that are shipped in Groovy Core. For every single one of them, you will see all the different parameters and uh, different configuration switches that you can use for all the transformations. There is also a nice presentation by Paul on Groovy Transformations uh, that gives you a lay of the land and going much deeper um, detail on the different compiler uh, phases and what are the expressions and statements and how you can put things together. And the last two links are actually the same. Uh, it's a history of the Groovy programming language available from the ACM. This is a document that Paul put out uh, earlier this year. It's a, well, it's a really extensive uh, document on the history of the language itself. And it does mention metaprogramming, of course. Now, everything what he has seen so far is, of course, is open source. You are more than welcome to uh, contribute. It's very easy to, to contribute to open source. Just open a ticket. And uh, that's it. You don't have to do more. It's just provide information about a, a, a bug or to provide information as a missing feature and uh, just engage in the conversation. If you have the time and if you want to, to share with us and uh, the code, then please, of course, uh, do it. And uh, we will certainly appreciate it. So uh, I think that's it. And uh, I think I have about a few more minutes uh, if, if anyone has any questions. How are we doing? All good. All right. Well, that's, it was quite a quick talk, and, but I hope it was a, um, a quick survey of the different options that you have for runtime and compile the meta programming. Yep. So most of the comments were just um, people talking about things they do and don't like. Okay. So I'm, I have to say that I'm quite excited by it, uh, the the at Pojo SD transformation that may be coming in Groovy 4, which will likely allow us to use Groovy as, as a companion or perhaps a replacement for Lombok. Now, I know that Lombok has its detractors and has its lovers, and I'm on team Lombok, by the way. I use it whenever I have to use Java. But if I had my way, I would use Groovy to generate all the code I want to and then mix it in with Java. So, so my teammates do not like the fact that the Groovy char has to be included as a dependency. So the, the need, the, uh, the ability to have add Pojo with some of the transformations that we saw today without having to include the Groovy jar as a dependency will be something that I'm really going to have a look at the next time. Yep, so if, if you have very simple classes, that's definitely the case. If you start doing fancier stuff inside your classes, you use the first closure or whatever, you know, whatever it might be, then, then you need the jar. Right, you have to constrain yourself to typical Java types and not Groovy types. Yep, so you'd have to be compile static. You'd, you could use uh, Lambda expressions, that would be okay. Um, yeah, but it's 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 still a work in progress because um, at the moment there are places, so if you go and look at the bytecode that would come from a Java class, you would see some bootstrap stuff added in these days to get to, to, for your, um, to get your method handles and things like that all set up when you're using lambdas and so on, um, we do that in our in our runtime at the moment. And not all of that, even if you put Pojo on there, not all of that gets converted yet. But we'll keep keep Correct. working on it. So someone asked, where are my most most used annotations besides canonical and immutable into a string? I do have plenty of annotations in in the Griffon project. 
So for example, there's NBC Aware, Ad Event Publisher, and so many others. And you can see there's plenty of transformations here, which, uh, I mean, you are more than welcome to look at the, how these transformations are implemented, which requires some sort of build-like pattern, which is just based on static methods. So some of them are coming from Groovy Core, and some other are coming from the, the Gryphon uh, utility methods. And if you're um, using other frameworks, Grails and whatever else, they'll be they'll have also have their own uh, transforms that you can have a look at. I, I yes, use, plenty of options. Yeah, Canonical, Immutable would be the two most frequently used ones. Two string, yep. And sometimes lazy as well. Yeah, and um, I think Memoized has already been given a um, and delegate sometimes. Yep. Delegate, yes, that's another nice one. And uh, builder, if I'm if I'm if I want to be fair with what I use from Lombok, which is that and builder. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, continue watching the uh, the other sessions. And please feel feel free to reach me out on Twitter or on the uh, the Groovy channels if you have any questions. And uh, keep on grooving. We'll know the um, link for the next session in a couple of minutes if people want to hang around. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Andreas. It was a great talk. Thank you.